All right, we'll go ahead and get going. <coughs> I've got a bit of a frog in my throat today, so hopefully that won't keep me down too much. Uh, there's, uh, I've got assignment nine up. I don't have the actual submission, and therefore I don't have the actual rubric up. I'll get that up this weekend. Uh, it's got the content overview. I don't have a quiz in there, <clears throat> so that should just say content overview. Uh, I'm thinking this will be due since the, there isn't any due information since that's in the submission part. I'm thinking like um, before Wednesday's class. So you'll have the weekend to do this and then uh, you'd be able to use that first lab of the week to, to work on this. And I don't think it's particularly difficult. This one should seem easier uh, despite the new material. It really isn't a very large program at all, just a few lines. And uh, anyway, I'm going to be talking about stuff that will be useful to this today. Uh, but prior to me diving into that, I'm happy to answer your questions. If any. Yes? Well, um, the command is then to open up uh, like a uh, to unzip and zip files like the random that you gave us. The <coughs> command for that? Uh, right. So the, the command for extracting archives, let me see. Let me grab a copy of it here real quick. Also, uh, we'll be I'll also be starting next week uh, the third project, and so I want to have four projects by semester's end. <clears throat> And if it seems like there are a lot of projects here towards the end, that's because there are a lot of projects here towards the end. And the reason is that when all you know is how to create an integer and do a for loop, it's hard to create a very big project. <clears throat> uh, let's see. All right, hang on. I'm getting there. So I, I would phrase it. I wouldn't phrase it how to in Vim extract archives, but rather how to at the shell extract archives. So this thing that's giving me the prompt is the shell prompt. Uh, PS is a command that shows <coughs> that shows um, processes that are running in this shell. It looks like it got three of them running here. I don't know why it's showing three. Maybe it, that's actually probably showing me that I have three terminal windows open, which I do down here. So that's showing me that for each one of those I have uh, a shell going. If I open up another window, now how many shells do I have going? Now I have four. Okay. Uh, What's the PID? Huh? What's the PID? <clears throat> so this is information that you'll get intimate with. Uh, you'll be, certainly become more intimate with it in operating systems. If you decide to take uh, systems programming, then you work with this stuff quite a bit. <clears throat> This means the process ID. So whenever you start a process, uh, again, if I, I, I can look at all processes in the system, it's giving me a lot of stuff, but I can basically do a uh, count of lines, and that tells me roughly that I have 225 processes currently running on my laptop. So for every process that gets started by the operating system kernel, it assigns it a process ID. And there's uh, bookkeeping information that is done on the process, and, and so the ID is the way for indexing into it or interacting with it. So when you learn systems level programming, then you are <clears throat> actually able to create separate processes that are communicating with each other, uh, among other things. There are all sorts of things that can happen uh, when you're dealing with programming at that level. But that's what that is. That's process ID. Uh, the TTY is uh, an arcane uh, uh, abbreviation for, I want to say, teletype. So back in the days where you didn't have screens, <laughs> and if you typed LS, then neat, 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 right? 
Uh, and of course, they didn't have Vim there. That'd be silly. Uh, <coughs> but uh, it, it, what that represents is uh, the terminal, <coughs> and the. Uh, so each one of these is being put into what's referred to as a virtual terminal. So there was, a, again, th this whole windowing concept is something that is slapped on top of Unix. So back in the day when I first started programming, there was a central Unix server in the office, and then 40 or 50 of us programmers would all log into that one machine the same way everyone logs into Jaguar, and we would have a physical terminal where we'd do our editing. Basically, our physical terminal looked like this. Only there weren't near. It was basically 80 characters this way and 24 up and down, right? Um, and so that's what that is. That goes back to those vestiges. Again, it's another another thing that programmatically you can interact at the terminal level with processes. This is the amount of time that the process has been running, and then this, of course, is what that command is uh, that was brought in off disk to run that process. <coughs> Um, so, anyway, we're at the shell. Did I already make this? And, um, so yes. So I wanted to get, I wanted to copy for my downloads this. Alright. <coughs> Whoops, I wanted to copy it into my current directory. So there it is. The question is, how do you extract this archive? Uh, first of all, Vim is very nice in that if you try to edit a compressed archive, uh, it'll actually pull it apart for you and let you look at the individual components. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't change them or write them out or anything like that. So what you have to do is actually extract the archive. Uh, the key to look at here is that this is a, a tar archive or what people would colloquially refer to as a tarball. In fact, they would say it's a gzip tarball. So tar is a command that will lump many files and many directories for that matter. So it's kind of hierarchical. You can take a whole directory hierarchy and all the files within it and bundle it into a single file. That's what tar does. That's what a tarball is, bundling many things into one. I think I mentioned earlier in the semester, it's a really, really old command. TAR actually stands for tape archive. It was used when you would dump backups to tape. Uh, GZ is a compression. So TAR is going to bundle them all together, but it doesn't try to make anything smaller. So if you had three megabytes worth of files, it's, you're going to have a three megabyte TAR archive. Uh, GZIP is going to try and compress it to make it smaller. Uh, PKZIP or just a zip in the Windows world would be the most common one there. So in order to extract it, I want to do the tar command. I want to extract the archive. It's not required for me to put the V, but the V means be verbose. Again, most Unix commands work silently, and tar is no exception. So verbose means to give us a little feedback as to what it's doing. Uh, I want to, Z means that it is a gzip tar ball, so the Z means to unzip it. And then F means the following thing is going to be the archive that I want to extract. <coughs> so that's how I do that. And the verbose, again, if I didn't provide the V, I would just get a prompt back because I provided the V. It's, uh, it's saying that it's extracting random.h and it's extracting random.cpp. I can do an ls and see it there. <coughs> And uh, then if you recall, you're able to create your own archives from earlier assignments. Uh, you're asked to create a gzip tarball for the JAWS project, weren't you? Yeah, so in essence, all the commands were, all the options here were identical, except you did a C for create instead of X for extract. All right, and then, and then you had to, after the name of the archive, you had to specify the files that you wanted to bundle up. <coughs> Uh, no, actually, it really doesn't matter the order. The only one where it matters is this one right here, because it means the thing that immediately follows the F is going to be the name of the archive. And uh, I said it, I've said it and emphasized it a few times. I'll do it one more time just for the sake of it. Um,
right? People are going to create an archive doing this, and what you're doing is you're saying, I want to create an archive with the file name weapon.cpp, and that archive will contain this, these files here. And so if you had a weapon.cpp, you no longer have a weapon.cpp. You've got a nice little archive with all of your files except weapon.cpp. Meaning that if, uh, if you've had weapon.cpp around long enough, you could go to Elbert and ask him to retrieve a backup of it. Um, otherwise, you'd have to type it back in. <clears throat> any other questions on this subject or any other subject? Yes. Um, on our Jaguar class, it uses GCC version 4.8.2. Um, how do we install that on other computers? <coughs> how do you install GCC on other computers? Uh, specifically version 4.8.2. Four. Um, well, let's see. What I would it, what I don't know is if they save bundles. So there's always going to be a nice little bundle for you to install it uh, what, uh, on a particular operating system that you're interested in. So Linux, um, GCC 4.8.2, Ubuntu. Have you messed around with apt-get on figuring out how to do it? Yeah, it's not available. <clears throat> All right, then what I... So it uh, can be a long process, but you might have to go back to the good old days of the way things were installed. So if I, can, if I just type in GCC in Google, this is the GNU compiler collection, as they call it. Uh, and there should be right here, 4.8.2, right? Uh, let's see if this lets me download it. Yeah, so I would have to find the operating system I'm interested in, or rather the, the uh, hardware architecture. Uh, so it would probably be, this one would probably be the one you wanted. Uh, an i686 uh, Linux PC. And yet you download it and, um, well, let's see if I, let me go ahead and click on this. You know, this, this is just giving me the release notes. It's not giving me the actual download link. Somewhere that you sh you'll be able to find, you'll be able to find a directory hierarchy where you can find all the versions. And uh, once you find that, let me just add download to my search stream here. <coughs> yeah, here you go. So you can go all the way back to 2.95. And so you click on whichever one you're interested in, you dump into this directory, uh, you're going to have to download, you know, like, like this one here. Uh, you can see that it's not small, 74 megs. That doesn't seem huge given that a DVD is 4 gig, but that's 74 megs of source code that someone typed in, you know, by the way, it's been compressed, right? And so then you have you open it up, and then there'll be a set of install directions for actually compiling it. So you actually have to compile the compiler, and then uh, install it. <clears throat> so it's a bit of a lengthy process to do it this way. Before I, I guess, I, I would say this is the good old days, the way everything was always installed. You'd find source bundles like this, build them, and then install them. Uh, that's your last resort now, I would try hard to see if you can find any sort of Ubuntu build that someone did of it already, because uh, it can be a lengthy process. Okay. <coughs> Other questions? Yes? Our next assignment, does it deal with arrays? It does deal with arrays, uh, but more importantly it deals with uh, dynamic memory. But yeah, arrays or arrays and dynamic memory. Anything else? All right. Let me go ahead and <clears throat> talk about dynamic memory then. I do want to. I do want to go back to the assignments here and point out one thing, lest you skip it. Okay. Content overview and quiz. 
uh, right here. So I provide these external resources like I have on several other assignments. Did I? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, these first two are two, tut two tutorials that I have written. <clears throat> one is on pointers, one is on arrays. Uh, unless you're already doing C or C++ jujitsu, you really need to go and do these two tutorials. Okay. Uh, so this is stuff that I, I'll be happy to answer questions on the tutorials in class, but I'm generally not going to do the tutorial in class. And I actually historically had at times done the tutorial. So uh, for you to get as much information as possible to understand all this stuff, you definitely want to do these two tutorials. And it shouldn't take too terribly long. Uh, all the codes provided, it's saying try this, try that, this is what's happening. So it's not, you know, it's not a terrible thing to do. All right. <clears throat> so dynamic memory. When we write code, <clears throat> and I want to oh, let's see, what example do I want to do here? Um, there are a number of situations where uh, you may need an memory, so let me provide one. I have a function, and I'm going to change this function as I go on. Uh, I need a, a date class. <coughs> Oops, wrong language. That's Python there sneaking in on me. All right, so I've got. I've got this date class. It's incomplete. That's all right. It's enough for my purposes. <clears throat> and what I want to do is get information. I have a function where I want to get information from the user. And I want to say, see out <clears throat> uh, what's the day and what's the month and what's the year. And I'll have CN statements. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going to skip the CN statements. Uh, this is turning into a nightmare. What do I want to do here? I'm going to create, I'm just going to create a set function. Void the date class has a set function that takes a month, takes a day, takes a year. And it sets month equal to M, day equal to today, and year equal to Y for year. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip all this and I'm just gonna <coughs> pretend I get the information from the user and I'm gonna create a date variable. I'll call it DT and I'm gonna give it July 4th, 1776. Okay. Um, but if I want to use that date <coughs> in main, I have issues. So I can say create date here. Oops, that's all right. I can say create date here, but what is the, the nature of this particular variable? Um, it's lifetime only is, goes from line 24 until it hits the end of the function, which in this case is line 25. Right, it's a local variable. And what I want to do is the variable that I'm creating, I actually want to persist until I make it go away. So I want to bring it into existence on line 24, <coughs> but then I want it to stay alive even after I call this function and so that I can do things with it further down here. So uh, the mechanism for doing this is what's called dynamic memory and the syntax is a little bit different than that I'll 
explain all of this. <coughs> all right. Uh, this does exactly what it looks like it does. That is creating a new date object, the same as what I had in line 24. Line 24 creates a date object, but again, my issue with the date object there is that it dies on line 26. This date that I'm creating here is going to exist until either I tell it to go away or the application quits. All right, so that thing's going to stick around and uh, for as long as we need it to. The, where it becomes a little bit dicey is <clears throat> how do I hold on to it? And in order to explain this a little better, I need to jump to my diagram. So I'm going to come here and I'll open up my trusty railroad track. And we'll call this dynamic memory. <clears throat> All right. When I say, what color do I have? When I say date dt, and I say 7 for 1776, <clears throat> looking back at my code, Whenever I create a date object, I get a day, a month, and a year. So I get a day, takes up this much room. This is the day. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I need more real estate, so I'm just going to have things today. This is the day. This is the month. And this is the year. And then this day, month, and year is all part of the DT variable. All right? <clears throat> so that's what happens when we create it the traditional way, like here on line 24. When I create it this way, <clears throat> it in, in essence does the same thing. Uh, what it does is it looks for somewhere out in memory that is available for it to create a date. And it finds some memory available right here. And it says this is the day, this is the month, and this is the year. But one thing that I did not give, and one thing you don't give with dynamic memory, is you don't give these things a name. So this thing does not have a name. All right, there's no, on this, this is where all the action is happening, and there is no name there. So if I, I, I what's going on? Where's my, there go. Oops, oh, well, that caps lock on. Uh, let me comment this out and focus on this bit of it here. <clears throat> so if I, if I do that, five times, I would actually come here five times and do this stuff here, right? I'd find five other places in my ribbon of memory to go ahead and draw that, and none of them would have a name. <clears throat> well, how can this thing possibly be useful if it doesn't give us a name? Well, what it does is this expression, if you will, gives us something. Remember, it's C, C and C++ are um, languages that represent things in expression. And so I'm going to ask the question of lines, I'll get, delete these. I'll ask the question of line 28 the same way I would ask the question of this. What kind of thing is the result of the expression on line 27? It's an integer, right? So the actual result of the expression is 9, but what I'm concerned about at this point is what kind of thing is given, and it's an integer that's given. Likewise, if I said 4.0 and 5.0, or even, well, I don't want to get that discussion, uh, that would, the result of that expression, the kind of thing it's going to be is a float. <clears throat> so the question is, what is the result of this expression? Because this expression does give us something back in the same way that 5 plus 4 gives us something back. And what this expression gives us back is this number right here, the address. The address. Okay. So now, 
we need basically we need a catcher's mitt to capture that address in the same sense that I need a catcher's mitt to catch, or, to catch the result of that expression, yes? In order for line 27 to work, I actually have to create A somewhere. And if I was to draw that, I'll erase it, but I'll just be gratuitous and draw it. Somewhere out here, I'm going to create a variable A, and it's going to do 5 plus 4, and the result of that expression is 9, and that's going to be assigned to A, so I'd put 9 there, right? That's kind of the routine I would do. All right. I have to do the same thing, is I have to create a variable that's going to grab that 112. So I'm going to, I gave it a really long name, what did I call it, date pointer, and I, I wrote it out slow like that too. So this is date pointer. Again, that's just the name of a variable. You can call it banana if you like. I'm just not into the fruits today. It's just strictly date pointer. And then the 112 is what goes inside that variable. <clears throat> so now, where I started with that 5 plus 4 discussion was the thing I'm concerned with is the kind of thing that 5 plus 4 returns. So you and I colloquially speak to this as being a pointer, but I need to, in C++ terms, describe the kind of thing that 112 is. And the tutorial goes into great, great depth on this in that you know and I know that that's nothing but a stupid integer. It's a stupid number. I guarantee you it's a stupid number. The tutorial does all sorts of interesting things to show you that it's just simply a number, all right? But uh, <clears throat> even though it is just a number, for C++ or C for that matter to be happy, we have to describe it as a special number designed to hold an address. So date pointer, the way you describe it is the way I've commented out here. Now let me go ahead and release the comment and draw our attention to it. Okay, <clears throat> if I'm creating a new date, then I have the word date here. It doesn't have to be a date. Uh, let me do some other things. All right, All right. sorry. I promised I wouldn't do that. Um, I can I can do this. You may be wondering about the 3.14. <clears throat> uh, I wouldn't have to do that now. Oh, this is if I had a three argument constructor, which I don't do. I I didn't create a three. All right. Oh well, I created a set function. Um, so I can. <clears throat> called run date. I can create a date calling a three argument constructor. Or I can call date calling the default constructor. Likewise, I can create a floating point number giving it the value 3.14. I can just create a float without assigning it any value, in which case it works the way memory has always been working this semester, which is what is inside memory is whatever was in there before. All right. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll with, with actually doing that. <clears throat> So that's the pattern. You say new, the kind of thing you want to create. If you want to initialize it to a certain value, go ahead and do that. And then you have to assign it to a float. And then you need this asterisk here. <clears throat> and the way you should read the asterisk is uh, either use the word address or pre probably what people are going to use more often is pointer. So you go up to you go to 311 or any of the upper division classes, and you listen to the students talking. They're going to say, "Well, the problem is that you don't have a, a float pointer here, or your your pointer isn't initialized. Pointer, pointer, pointer. Right? That's like the favorite word up when you get to the higher levels. Uh, it ends up being one of the most difficult concepts, even though it may not look too terrible. When you start programming with it, you get confused very, very quickly. Uh, but it's fundamental. I would say this right here, what you're getting this very second, is the bread and butter of C and C++ programming, and it understanding it, uh, all else follows. It's kind of like um, calculus. So anyone doing graduate level math, anyone, anyone going to any graduate program in the sciences, calculus is the common denominator to everything. You go to graduate statistics, you go to computational biology, all that kind of stuff. Everyone needs to know calculus to do it, so that's kind of the lowest common denominator. This is the lowest common denominator, is dealing with addresses and pointers in programming. 
So you have to create a date pointer, give it whatever name you want, and then it is assigned this new date. So it looks exactly the way I've written it here. <clears throat> now the next question is how do we access this variable? So let me actually, um, I'm going to abandon this code so that I can post it as is, kind of messy notes, but let me start afresh. So I'm going to create a float pointer, fp <coughs> equals new float. I'll give it 3.14. Let's try printing it out. And we might halfway expect to get 3.14. But we don't get 3.14, almost. No. So this is the address inside of my machine where that floating point number is sitting. Okay. Uh, it begins with a 0x. That just means the number that follows is in hexadecimal instead of normal decimal. I think I can actually make it decimal if you prefer to see it that way. I think if I do, I don't do this a lot, so I'm going off. Uh, faulty memory here. I think if I do something like that, oops, that will print that out in decimal. No. Like that. Right. <laughs> uh, oh, probably like this. <laughs> All right. It's something in twenty quadrillion. Yeah, I did that right. Same as inserting ten. Now let's see the sample program. I don't know. That's right, that looks right to me. Well, all right, so I, I can, I think I can sledgehammer this thing. This is, and spending so much time on what's not very fulfilling at all. So that's a decimal number, right? Memory begins at 1 or 0, and it's somewhat higher than that location in memory. <coughs> if I run it again, note that it's not in the same location, right? If we look at these last few digits here, it's clearly in a different location. Why? Because I have... 224 processes running. Their processes starting and stopping all the time. There's a kernel to the operating system that's managing all the processes and it's saying, you run in memory over here, you run in memory over here, oh there's a new one, why don't you run in memory over here, you're quitting, okay that memory's free, right? And it's constantly managing this, this dance of all these processes. So every time I run this program, it is running in a different location. And so that's why that number's changing. <coughs> So how do I get the actual number? And this is this is so extremely confusing. And again, I try to help with the confusion in the tutorial, using explaining it a totally different way than I'm doing it now. I take a totally different approach to talking about this stuff in the tutorial. So it's another reason to see the tutorial for hearing things a different way. Let me run this. Again, this is the address. I put an asterisk in front of this. Let's uh, look at the output first. So there's my 3.14. <clears throat> so by virtue of putting an asterisk in front of this, it prints the number. And this asterisk is not the same as this asterisk. Meaning here, I would call this a noun. I would call this a verb. Here I'm doing something, right? That's a verb. Here I'm, I'm describing something. That's a noun. Car, the blue car. Here is driving or crashing. Um, 
So in a, when you look at this, if it's in a noun context of me creating or describing something, I'm saying that this is a, a pointer to a floating point number. FP holds the address of a float. No, by the way, here's that float. Here, in the verb, it is, please get the contents at that address. So when I do line 8, It is, I, I'm saying uh, FP dollar or asterisk, so pretend this is a float. I've got a date here. It sees the 112 and it gets the contents at whatever's at 112. So if my floating point number was here, the 3.14, it would get it would go to 112 and get the contents there, and that's what would spit out to the screen. Without the asterisk, I get the 112. With the asterisk, it goes to 112 and gives me the contents. All right? <clears throat> um, let me then talk about it in terms of uh, classes. I'll do time. I'm going to create a display function. I'm going to create, um, I guess I'll, I'll create a constructor. The, the time constructor takes an hour, takes a minute. I'm going to be good and use my initialization list, and the hour initializes to H, and the minute initializes to M. Empty curly braces. I'll even put them on the same line. I'll even put them up there to save me space. And I've got... Uh, a display function that belongs to the time class. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to see out the hour, a colon, colon, and the minute, <clears throat> end of the display function. Let me test it real quick. Uh, I'm going to create a time TM at 853, and then I want to say tm.display. So let's make sure that code works. Using namespace standard. All right, there's my time, 853. <clears throat> now let's deal with pointers. Uh, I'll leave that there. I'm going to create a... So help me out. You all help me out. <coughs> How do I create a time pointer variable? I need to give it a name. Uh, how about TP for time pointer? Yeah, now, now I'm going to do it a little bit differently just to ensure that you understand the flexibility. I can create a variable and initialize it at a different point in time, right? I don't have to do it all in the same line. Uh, I'll call this uh, 1220. <clears throat> okay, the way I call the display function is I say the name of the variable in a dot, right? So how do I get the, that's, <clears throat> I guess I should draw a picture of what we're looking at here with TP. Dynamic memory for time. Okay, so <clears throat> first thing I do is I create TP. I not do that in blue. So this is TP. 
And I don't initialize it to anything, so who knows what's in there. Now I'm going to create a new time and set it to 1220. So every any time I ever create is going to have an hour and a minute. So this will be the hour, this will be the minute. And this whole thing doesn't have a name. But it is a, a time, I'd refer to it as a dynamically created time object. But then the result of this expression is to return the address of where it created it. So it created it starting at 108, so that's what this the result of this expression is, is 108, and it is assigned to a time pointer variable. So this has 108. Okay. Oh, and I'd set it to 1220. So this has 12, this has 20. <coughs> now, TP, if I print out, what am I going to get if I do that? I'm going to get the address. So what if I want the object itself? The asterisk. asterisk. OK, now what if I want to call the display function? Yeah, everyone agree with that? I agree with it. OK, that's what you have to do. But there's one big caveat. I type C++ precedence. C++ operator precedence. I'm going to blow this up a little bit. <clears throat> this is the dot. Yeah. This is the asterisk. Which has higher precedence? The dot has higher precedence. So if I had to, if I put this on the test, the way you would have to do the parentheses is you would have to say, that there is a set of parentheses here. And actually, interestingly enough, that is in the precedence table as well, but I'm going to ignore that. So there's a set of parentheses around that, and then there is a set of parentheses around the whole thing afterward. Let me see. Maybe I need to put them in here. I'll, I'll use square brackets to differentiate them from the parentheses I already have in here. So this happens first, and then this happens second. Okay, everyone see why that is? Because I go to the precedence table and one has to happen before the other. That isn't right, because dot doesn't work with addresses. Dot works with an object, right? So what do we have to do to fix it? We have to make sure that the star TP occurs before the dot display, so we have to put parentheses around the star TP. Okay? It's a hassle. Nobody likes to do this. The creators of the language thought it was silly to, ha to do this. You can do it. It'll work. Let me just show that it'll work. Okay, there's my 1220, so it works just fine. <clears throat> However, the creators of the language said, you know, as because Todd's going to say it someday, that it's the bread and butter of the language, that you're going to be using this stuff all the time. It's a huge hassle to have to dereference things, uh, objects this way. So we're going to provide a shortcut. These two are identical. They mean exactly the same thing. If you use that little arrow, meaning a, a hyphen and a greater than symbol right next to each other, no spaces, right? Just as I can't take A plus plus and say A plus space plus. You can't have spaces between those, so those two characters are together, although you can do this certainly if you want. Uh, that means get the contents of this pointer and then call this function on the contents. So it does, those, it does the parentheses and the two steps for you. And it, it's visually very pleasing, comparatively speaking, anyway. Okay. And let's run it and confirm I'm not going crazy, and I'm not. Okay, another day off the meds and still living high in life. Any questions on that? <clears throat> yes? Do we, what is that? Do we copy the pointer in the presenter or can we keep the parentheses with the asterisk? Uh, it turns out that 
this assignment does not involve uh, classes, meaning like the date class. And so this is peculiar to classes, right? Or if you're in the C language, it's peculiar to data structures. Uh, this arrow stuff has no meaning at all when I was dealing with this, right? If I need FP, I, I, if I need the contents of FT, I just put an asterisk in front of it. There's no dot anything because there's no dot anything with floating point numbers. And uh, if I recall, the assignment is working with, it's either working with ints or floats. So you don't need to worry about it for this coming assignment. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you the word of the day. Uh, definitely, if you do anything this weekend, get through those tutorials. It shouldn't take too long. The word of the day, imbroglio. Okay, so I... I'm happy that on this Friday you attended my imbroglio. <clears throat> and uh, I want you all to have an awesome weekend. We will see you on Monday.